Today's webinar is called Question and Answer Forum, Understanding Letters of Credit. Uh, we'll be discussing the importance of letters of credit in the international trade process and how they can not only possibly increase your sales and profit, but also uh, hopefully decrease your liability in that international trade process. Um, today's webinar is sponsored by Scarborough University. SCARU was founded in 2006 uh, with a mission to provide necessary, relevant, and continuing education to Scarborough employees and our clients and professionals engaged in the international and domestic trade and logistics industry. Uh, my name is Chad Cluton. Uh, I'm a certified export specialist. And I have the privilege of being a team lead uh, in our export operations department here in Scarborough, Nash Scarborough International in Kansas City. Um, and so it's an honor for me to be with you guys today. Thank you once again for joining us. Um, this is an interactive webinar, so we're here to answer your questions as uh, time permits throughout the, throughout the webinar. Um, you'll find a question and answer button um, at the top of your screen. You can go ahead and click on that at any time, even right now, and submit your questions. And they'll appear for the entire audience to see. Um, so you can either choose to show your name or be anonymous. And uh, so if you guys can start submitting them now, that way we can compile them and answer them throughout the webinar as we, as we move along. <clears throat> Excuse me. Also, you'll note you'll notice on the top of your screen there's an easily there's an easy way to adjust your your windows so that you can maximize or minimize different parts of the webinar, whether it's the, the presentation or or our lovely pictures. Um, please note uh, you can do that now. So as you guys are doing that, um, also submitting your questions and adjusting your screens, I'll take a little bit of time to introduce you to what Scarborough is and who we are. Um, Scarborough is one of the top customs brokers in the nation, and we've been uh, in business for over 32 years. We are headquartered here in kind of the heart of America in Kansas City, Missouri, uh, where we believe faith, family, and, and hard work make for a great organization. So we also have offices in Chicago, St. Louis, Laredo, Nuevo Laredo, Mexico, and Shanghai, China, as well as Des Moines. Um, we also value our local and national partnerships with other business entities, you know, that, that help our clients and offer additional services like Commerce Bank, they're joining us here today. Uh, we have a truly a great partnership with all of them and we, we offer that to our clients so they can help them as, as much as we can. Um, we also um, have a network of companies that helps puts us in every country around the globe so we can meet the needs of all of our customers whether meeting their import or export uh, requirements throughout the, throughout the world. Um, we value each and every one of our partnerships with our clients and we strive to build those relationships every day with them. Um, as always, I'd like to thank each of you guys for being here today. Um, to, to our many great clients, we want to thank you for being willing to partner with us. And if you are not yet a Scarborough client, we invite you to uh, look into uh, how we can help partner with you and build your trust, build trust with you to uh, maximize your international trade uh, volume. So it's a pleasure for me now to introduce you to our panelist, Drew Fellin. Drew is a certified global partner. Uh, global business professional at Commerce Bank. And before that, prior to joining the bank, he was, for 20 years, he was helping different businesses, both importers and exporters, uh, to help improve their supply chain logistics and grow their international sales volumes. So, welcome, Drew. Thanks, Chad. Appreciate the opportunity to be here. Yeah, appreciate the invite. Yeah, um, we really like working with Scarborough, and we appreciate you know the opportunity to work with your customers and help them with the finance side of their international transactions. And we know that we can partner with you for the logistics business as well. So just to start out, you may know Commerce Bank, but it's uh, headquartered uh, dual in Kansas City and St. Louis. It's a $25 billion bank, and it's the 34th largest bank in the United States, uh, publicly traded. has about 4,400 4, employees and covers a footprint from Minnesota to Texas and Colorado and over to Tennessee. The International Department is uh, 100 years old and has been headquartered in Kansas City all that time. And it's comprised of 35 different people, and they have an average of 10 years of experience on the desk, some 20 and 30 years of experience. And I work in the International Trade Department for the International Team. So what I do is I help importers and exporters make payments and get payments, and then also work, work with export working capital loans with the SBA and the XM Bank. My colleagues, uh, Paul Toskin in St. Louis is doing the same, covering the Eastern uh, footprint. And then Brian Gordon, our senior VP, covers uh, a territory as well for the international trade. And then we have foreign currency traders on staff that buy and sell currencies for the customers, maybe 60 different currencies throughout the year. And as far as international, uh, we have a network of 600 uh, correspondent banks that we do business with around the world. 
And how we communicate is via SWIFT codes. And SWIFT codes are you know, Society for Worldwide Interbank Financial Telecommunications. So it's actually one of the um, organizations that has the most successful um, participation. You know, it's voluntary around the world, but there's about 9,000 financial institutions that are in this program. And that's how we uh, can authenticate, you know, that who the person is talking to is actually who they say they are. So, yeah. but I appreciate coming today to talk to you about international trade and, and letters of credit. And um, we appreciate partnering with um, Scarborough because we tell our customers if they have a good international freight forwarder and a good international bank, they're pretty much set to go. That's great. Can, uh, well, yeah, well, we start out. And, yeah. you know, when we uh, start with the first slide. You know, what is a letter of credit? You know, a letter of credit is basically a, a financial transaction where uh, the banks promise to make payments to each other if a certain list of predetermined uh, uh, you know, documents or requirements are take take place. So we move the risk from the buyer and seller to the foreign bank and the uh, U.S. bank. So in an export transaction, um, the overseas buyer would go to his bank and open up a, a letter of credit. And so they would put a hold, let's say it's $100,000. The um, issuing bank puts a $100,000 hold, issues a letter of credit. They send it to us via SWIFT. We authenticate it, and we tell the shipper, we do have received this document for you, and then it's uh, okay to proceed. Then the shipper uh, moves the shipment, and then that bill of lading most often is required by the letter of credit to, in order to transfer payment. So the bill of lading is, is sent to us most likely from you or from the shipper, and then we review the documents, make sure they're accurate and that they're matching the requirements within the letter of credit, and then we submit those to the form bank, and once the form bank approves and accepts those documents, then payment uh, takes place. So why would someone use a letter of credit in general just to reduce that risk and help them mitigate any possible pitfalls along the way? Right, you know, a lot of people think that letters of credit are complicated and, and time-consuming and expensive, and you know, they can be, but we, we try to make it easier for all of our customers, and really that's a nice way to think about it. If, if you have, foreign customers paying you under a letter of credit. A lot of exporters don't realize they can have any bank in the USA review those documents for them. What typically happens is an overseas bank will issue a letter of credit, they'll send it to their partner bank in the United States, let's say it's J.P. Morgan Chase or Wells Fargo, and then typically that's in New York, and they will contact the shipper and say, I already have these documents for you, why don't you just let me review these documents and process them for you. But in reality, that exporter can say, thank you very much. No, I prefer to have my own bank review the documents on my behalf. Please send those to Commerce Bank or whoever you're working with. Okay. So, if, 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 but what we tell them is that you're, you want a bank reviewing the documents on the exporter's behalf, not a bank that is working on the buyer's behalf. Right. So, we can trust. But yeah, buyers and sellers that are unknown to each other, a lot of times will want to use letters of credit and buyers and sellers whose credit relationship is faltered. If you've given someone an open account, you can no longer trust them because of something, you might want to move back to a letter of credit. And then, you know, sellers who want to increase export sales, and I think we'll talk about that a little bit later in the, um, in the webinar, but that's a, it's a key factor in using letters of credit. And then uh, buyers who want credit terms. A lot of times, a buyer will say, I want 30, 60, 90 days, and we can do that on a letter of credit, but also discount and pay the buyer, or the sh shipper, before that time comes up. That's great. Let's go to the next slide. So how might company uh, benefit from using a letter of credit? Peace of mind. I mean, it, open account, you're worried. Uh, cash in advance, you know, is very difficult on the buyers a lot of time. And when you're using a letter of credit, we're relying on the relationship and the credit level and the uh, reputation of your bank and the foreign bank. So every bank has a credit rating, so we're moving that risk up to the bank levels and reducing that risk to you from a shipper and an uh, importer. And then building relationships. A lot of people will start out with letters of credit and then eventually maybe move to cash against documents, which is sort of like letters of credit light, and then perhaps uh, go to open account you know, later on. So we can uh, flip to the next slide that we have, and that's talking about the, the scale of payment terms and the risks that are involved. So you see on this scale that it says what's the least amount of risk to an exporter, and what's the least amount of risk to an importer. 
So for an exporter, it's, you know, of course, cash in advance is the best way to go that they would like to see us. We hear a lot of uh, CFOs say, if we want to do exports, I want cash in advance and I want U.S. dollars. But that's best case scenario, but a lot of times maybe you can't get that. And if you're talking to some of the export salespeople that need to make their numbers and get their sales growth, if you're looking at an opportunity to use a letter of credit that's a guaranteed payment and you can give terms, that might be an option. So cash in advance first is the best one for the shipper, then a letter of credit, and then the next one would be cash against documents or, um, you know, what's, what's a documentary collection is another way people say that, or letter of credit like means you still have the banks transfer the information, transfer the documents, and transfer payment. We're just not checking all of the documents to make sure everything is perfect. So it's sort of like a letter of credit, but it can go faster if it works properly, and it can be less expensive. Now, at this point, I should mention something about letters of credit. The overall transaction that banks are taking care of is we're guaranteeing payment under the letter of credit, that the documents provided are accurate. We have nothing to do with the sales contract between the buyer and the seller. Um, if the buyer says he's buying a container load full of widgets and he gets half a container load, that has nothing to do with the payment process. That would have to happen in between the buyer and seller discussion outside of the LC. So the best to think of those in two separate departments. The documents are between you and the other bank and the freight is between the buyer and the seller. Right. This is guaranteed payment transaction. That's a transaction of sale. So the International Chamber of Commerce uh, authenticates and um, creates doc uh, documents that we follow. For example, uh, letters of credit are um, the, the procedure we follow is UCP 600. So it's Uniform Customs and Practices put out by the International Chamber of Commerce of six, uh, UCP 600. And then INCO terms, International Chambers of Commerce, International Commercial Terms of Sale, are also uh, organized by them and put out under ECO terms 2010. But as we were talking about the scale of risk, you do letter of credit, um, then letter of credit light or documentary collections, and then open account. So one factor is better for, uh, for importers and one is better for others. So can you maybe touch on, and you maybe we'll get to this later, you can let us know then, but how long does it take usually to get paid from the time the documents are submitted to the bank? Well, I think the, uh, the process the slide, if we could switch to that next one, that'll help us uh, understand the, the process. So let's talk about uh, an, an exporter with a letter of credit. Uh, typically what we'd like to see you do is when you give it in uh, to someone who's buying from overseas, go ahead and give them instructions on how you want that letter of credit set up. Now we have a template that we give to exporters and it shows them how best to uh, de uh, devise that letter of credit in their best interest. So you can dictate to your foreign buyer, this is how I want the letter of credit to be opened. So he should review that with his bank, create a draft, send it back to you so we can review that ahead of time before it's issued to avoid uh, amendments and so forth. And then, you know, put that letter of credit in place. So once the foreign bank issues the letter of credit on behalf of the importer, they'll send a swift message to us. And then we will receive that and notify the shipper, we have received the letter of credit, it's okay to go ahead and process and ship your, your, your goods. So typically what's required in the letter of credit process is a bill of lading. It could be a truck bill of lading, most often it's an airway bill or an ocean bill of lading. That and other documents must FOB uh, Houston, and that's freight on board Houston, meaning you're responsible for getting the goods to the port of Houston, and it leaves your dock on May 1st. It takes two days to get to the port May 2nd. There's a sailing on May 3rd. And then that bill of lading comes back to you and comes to the bank maybe by two days. You know, we're getting that by May 6th. We'll review those documents. If everything's correct, we will courier those documents to the foreign bank. And then they have five days to review the documents and come back to us and say they accept the documents or they want an a, a amendment to be made. So May 6th, May 7th, five days for the foreign bank to review. And then they accept and they make a payment back. We could be up to you know May 15th, and then we turn around and deposit that money in the shipper's account. So 
depending on when the, the bill of lading is issued and where you are in the shipping process, it could be as little as 10 to 15 days to get your, your money. Okay. So, good to know. But in this um, process that we're talking about, you have an exporter, you have an importer, you've got the importer's bank, who's the issuing bank, and then you have the exporter's bank, typically in the States, who's the advising bank. So we uh, take the risk of telling you, yes, this is a bona fide letter of credit, and we accept that, that the payment is going to be made by that foreign bank. And then you can also do something which is called uh, confirming the letter of credit. And a confirmation is where you say, hey, Drew, I'm worried about this bank in this foreign country. There's some political upheaval right now. Uh, maybe they'll put a lock on money coming out of that country. Let's move the risk from the foreign bank to the U.S. bank, and that's called confirmation. So for a fee, we would say, fine, no longer responsible to rely on the foreign bank to pay, but Commerce Bank is on the hook to pay you no matter what, as long as the documents are in place. So that's so called a confirmation. That'd be a confirmed letter of credit. Confirmed letter of credit versus unconfirmed letter of credit. And, and that's where the, the risk still stays in the foreign bank. Now, on un, right, on unconfirmed letter of credit, the risk is at the foreign bank paying. Under a confirmed letter of credit, it typically moves to a U.S. bank that is required to pay. Now, a lot of times uh, people will say, should we, you know, confirm this? And we will tell you honestly, you know, we have a relationship with 600 different banks. We do credit checks on all of the banks we do letters of credit on. And if it's a AAA rated bank that's been in business for 150 years and it's a stable political environment, there's no need to spend the money for a confirmation. You know, we're, we're comfortable that that payment's going to come through. Sure. To use it in uh, in uh, dangerous countries is what you're saying. So. Typically, right. There's certain countries that may be a little bit more um, chaos and upheaval right now. So we would say, go ahead and confirm that, and let's uh, see if we can move that to this side to take some of the risk away from you. Great. Okay. Let's uh, flip over to the next uh, slide. So in addition to uh, a documentary letter of credit also known as a irrevocable letter of credit, there is a standby letter of credit. And standby letters of credit are just like it sounds, it's standing by. Ideally, they never come into play. So it's a credit instrument that assures the two parties that if the agreement is not met, that the per one party can draw on that standby letter of credit. So there's a lot of domestic uses. Most of the standbys that the bank issues are for domestic transactions. It's a company that is building uh, a new facility and the insurance company wants to make sure that they, if they do fault on the loan or they do not finish the project, then they can draw on that standby. But in a situation where it's an international standby letter of credit, typically what happens is the, it can be, you know, the foreign buyer is worried about putting up a 30% deposit. And he says, well, you want cash in advance, what if you don't ship? So I'm, I'm out 30% of my money. So what the uh, shipper could then do is, okay, Mr. Buyer, I'll put up a standby letter of credit for 30% amount that you deposited with me. And if I don't ship, then you can draw on that standby letter of credit and get your 30% back. So it's like an insurance policy that sits out there and ideally is never used. Best case scenario is you, know, you do a standby letter of credit for uh, prepayment and then the transaction goes through and the final payment is made and the standby letter of credit just goes away. There can also be other scenarios where you can use a standby letter of credit. We have customers that bid on projects overseas. So for example, the government of Ethiopia is buying airplane parts and they wanna make sure that the people that are bidding on that are valid companies that are really gonna follow through. So they do something called a bid bond or a bid guarantee. So that means put up $5,000, and that means you're gonna give them a valid bid. But if for some reason, you know, you were not able to fulfill that bid obligation, they could draw on that $5,000 because you wasted their time. Mm -hmm. So that's a bid bond, and if you win that bid, the next level of a standby could be a performance bond. Okay, the buyer's worried that you're gonna complete the transaction, and he wants you to put up a, a, a standby letter of credit that he can draw on if he don't fulfill the obligation. So if you fulfill the obligation, the standby goes away, and then the balance would be maybe a warranty uh, bond or warranty guarantee. They wanna make sure that for the next two years afterwards, if something happens, they'll be able to draw on that if you're not fulfilling the warranty obligation to them. Sure. 
So in, in the United States, the standby letters of credit are uh, a common term. Overseas, especially in Europe, you're going to hear the term bank guarantee. And, you know, the United States banks don't issue bank guarantees, but it is a valid process in many other countries. So what we can do is if someone says, I need to provide a bank guarantee to the gas company in India so I can sell these products to them, then we will ask one of our uh, correspondent banks to help us. We will issue a standby letter of credit to Deutsche Bank New York, and Deutsche Bank New York will issue a standby letter of credit to a bank in India that is their partner, and then that bank will issue a bank guarantee to the gas company. So it's kind of like a back-to-back, -back, but we can accommodate those bank guarantees. And that's a question that comes up sometimes for us is, my customer is asking for a bank guarantee, and I don't know how to get that. So, <clears throat> all right, I think that pretty much uh, covers the few slides that I was going to talk about. And I think we'll probably move it into the next section is Q&A. Yeah, we have uh, quite a few questions. Uh, just a reminder, feel free to keep submitting those questions. We've got a few of them uh, here queued up, ready to go. So um, feel free to uh, keep sending them our way. We'll get to them as many as we can. Um, you, you already, one, one, one of our uh, viewers asked about between a confirmed and unconfirmed, you touched on that. So um, if there's any more questions on that, on a confirmed or unconfirmed, feel free to send those in. Um, but one of our one of our questions is: uh, Is there a benefit to use a third party such as RHDC, RHDC International, to work with a freight forwarder on letters of credit? And what are the pros and cons? So I guess the question in this scenario is: RHDC stands for Red Hot Documents, and it's an organization that typically uh, is helping with the legalization of documents. Let's say the foreign embassy requires um, a certification by the uh, embassy in the United States before a shipment can take place into that country. And um, I gather that Red Hawk Documents is also saying, hey, let me prepare your documents that are required in the export letter of credit. I mean, it's uh, a lot of people do the export letter of credit documents themselves, and there are document preparation organizations out there. Some are professionals that have their own business and used to work for banks and letters of credit for many years, and they can do that for a fee. Some freight forwarders uh, will do the documents for you on the shipper's behalf, or you can use someone like um, RHTC. I think that's fine. It just depends on your comfort level. Um, you will have to pay for that fee, but a lot of times if you're working with an export letter of credit in a U.S. bank, we're also helping you to fix those documents and telling you what's wrong and going back to the freight forwarder and working in conjunction with the freight forwarder. So it may be overkill to have a third party organization help with those documents. But you know, there's many organizations out there that do that. So you just maybe just test the waters. I think if you, after a while you get used to it and you realize I need the commercial invoice to say this, I need the packing list to say this, and I need the you know, certificate of origin and so forth. But it, you know, the more involved you are with uh, export transactions, I think the more control you have and the better opportunity to have more export sales. Yes. I know that uh, Scarbo does help provide a lot of our documents for our customers in terms of letters of credit. If they need help or need assistance, we can we can assist with that and make those happen as well. So um, in, in regard, in another question in regard to the documents, someone asked, how important is it to match the spelling and grammar uh, used in a letter of credit? If somebody, uh, sends a letter of credit in and they misspell your name or their name, then technically, you know, the commercial invoice should have that misspelling as well. So, you know, it's very detailed. We want to eliminate the opportunity for the foreign bank to call out a discrepancy and say, this is therefore making the letter of credit null and void because it doesn't match. These are exacting details that really, in, in modern day transactions, don't come into play. More often than not, what we're trying to do is make all documents perfect and to match exactly what the letter of credit says and keep it simple. If you have a very long um, you know, description of your goods, that's great, but when you come to the letter of credit, just keep it simple. Say, you know, four skids containing auto parts, and that's it. It doesn't have to be the entire process, so it's just more room for error. So we're eliminating errors as much as we can, and that's the goal. But you have a presentation period of time that you have to submit those documents to the foreign bank. And if we're running out of time and we can't fix all of the documents, 
what you do at that point is you submit payment, you submit documents to the foreign bank on approval. That means we have some discrepancies, maybe something was misspelled and it doesn't match up, and you're hoping that the buyer and the buyer's bank will disregard these and accept the letter of credit documents and make payment anyway, even though you have these discrepancies. And really, that's the most common scenario that happens in letter of credit transactions. The buyer wants the goods, he's not trying to, it would, he would just be delaying his own ownership of those goods he's purchasing if he complains about a T that's not crossed or an I that's not dotted. But it does happen. That's good, good to know. Um, can Another viewer asked, can my bank review the documents and if things are in order, can they send a demand to the issuing bank to wire my funds immediately? Yes, the foreign bank has five days to um, review documents that we submit to them. So. We can, you know, send swift messages, but they, we courier the documents, so you have to wait for them to fix and get them. And the UCP 600 says, you know, I want five days, or they have five days to review documents before they come back and say, these are discrepant, we want an amendment, or yes, we accept these and we'll make payment. So it depends on what you mean by immediately. I think what some people can do, if you're trying to speed up the process on how quickly you get your payment, for example, if you're shipping Incoterm X works, then in your letter of credit, you call out um, one of the required documents is that truck bill of lading. So as soon as that cargo leaves your dock, that's the uh, document that you submit to the bank and sends to the foreign bank. So it may start the payment process before your cargo even gets on the ship. So, but an FOB, a bill of lading, does have so many days involved with that. But um, you could speed up the process also by confirming the letter of credit. So therefore, it's not the foreign bank you're waiting to review and accept the documents, it's the US bank. So if they say confirm at Commerce Bank, and then you submit documents to me, as long as we like those documents and we accept them, payment can be made on this side. Okay, that's good. Speaking of uh, payment, you mentioned Incoterms. Someone asked here, what are the best Incoterms to buy on when using an LLC or letter of credit? So on uh, imports, if you're importing something, say from Asia, and you're buying, on, where you're paying under a letter of credit, my recommendation is buy freight on board or free on board FOB foreign port. So the more control you have over the process, the better. That means you're picking it up from uh, FOB Shanghai, it's your freight forwarder, it's your insurance, and you're getting those documents as soon as they are loaded onto that vessel. So, and that way you can process your documents related to the letter of credit that much faster. If you had it the other way where it was CIF, cost, insurance, and freight, you know, terminal Kansas City, where well, you're allowing your Chinese supplier to get it all the way to you, you have no control over those documents and where they are and how quickly they come to you. On it. Yeah, but I flipped that story around. It's all about the control. When you're exporting and you're getting a payment via letter of credit, I'm going to encourage you to sell cost insurance and freight for import. Once again, because it's your freight forwarder, your insurance company, and you're controlling those documents. The most common thing we see in a letter of credit is you're shipping X works, meaning you know as soon as it leaves your dock, the foreign buyer is responsible for it. But then the letter of credit calls out. Give me a copy of the bill of lading. Well, it's not your freight forwarder, and you have no obligation to get that bill of lading because the transaction transferred at X works. But invariably, we have a lot of letters of credit where that, that shipper will agree to chase that bill of lading down and submit it with the documents. So, so see, cost and insurance and freight, or cost and freight cost, that's the CFR term that you're speaking of. Just to if people aren't familiar with the Inco terms. Right. So, far. so the, inter the International Commercial Buying Terms put out by the International Chamber of Commerce, I think the latest one is 2010, yep. and they'll give you a description of every one of those different ones. Uh, at CIF, cost insurance and freight, I always recommend that over cost and freight because CFR does not include insurance. So uh, it's while it's under your uh, jurisdiction, you want to have that insured. And a lot of times, trade forwarders can broker those insurances as well, I believe. Great. Um, and you, someone else asked, a confirmed letter of credit will help to ensure 
uh, quicker payment than from the United States. Correct. Correct. Okay. We're moving the risk from the foreign bank to the U.S. bank. Now, something about that, you know, usually charges related to a letter of credit that happen in the shippers or the beneficiaries country are paid for by the shipper. Tra uh, documents and, and letter of credit fees that come from the issuing bank are usually paid for by the applicant or the buyer. But that doesn't mean that during your sales uh, communication and negotiations, you can't say, hey, Mr. Buyer, I want you to pay under a letter of credit and I want you responsible for all charges. Or I'm going to confirm this letter of credit to move the risk to my country's bank, but I want you, Mr. Buyer, to pay for that confirmation. It's all down to negotiation on what who will pay for what. And who generally pays for the cost to process a letter of credit and how is that determined? So um, it's typical that the cost of letter of credit on the importer side is paid for by the importer and the cost of letter of credit transactions on the shipper side is paid for by the shipper. But you can reverse that and say, I want the buyer to pay all charges. It's whatever you all agree upon. Typically, if I was importing something and I was going to pay under letter of credit, you should expect to have fees that might be 1% of your transaction. On an export letter of credit, it's pretty affordable. It's typically $125 for having a bank review those uh, documents for you. Uh, it gets into a little bit more money when you confirm that and move the risk to the U.S. bank. Okay. That's great. Um, and going back to the beginning, when you talked about uh, helping to create those instructions back and forth between the seller and the buyer, um, can Scarborough or Commerce Bank help me uh, to create those? And if you, you said you had a template, do you consider, do you, do you, can that be mailed out? As well, it's available. Yes, it can be mailed out. We can send it to anybody that it is interested in that. It's also, uh, I believe, available for download from our website. But I'll have to double check that because I know the applications are on the website. But what we've done is we've created a PDF template with the standard um, language that is used when a foreign buyer is creating a letter of credit with his bank. And then we, as a bank, will we work with the shipper, the exporter, and come up with the best terms. Do you want this? you know, at site or give terms of 30 days or 60 days. When do you want the expiry date? When do you want the ship date? What documents do you want required? And you can complete that ahead of time and that would be your company's standard agreement. And here's my commercial, and here's my uh, sales invoice, my pro forma. If you buy this product from me, it's $100,000 and I want you to pay via letter of credit. Here's the instructions. So that can go out at the same time. That's great. And so there's a list of instructions on that template that they can help the right. buyers or so, sellers. And so the buyer will take that and go to their bank and say, hey, this is the template that Commerce Bank is recommending we use. A lot of banks have their own template. So the foreign bank may say, well, we like our template. And so then there's a negotiation back and forth via email and drafts before it's issued to eliminate the cost of making changes to after it's been issued. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, Let's see here, we got uh, a couple more. Someone actually, uh, we have a new, obviously with the opening up of Cuba, there's some possible trade there. Someone says our company exports uh, seeds. Um, we have an AGR letter from the BIS to sell into Cuba. Do you have experience or advice on letters of Cuba, a letter, on letters of credit with Cuba? Hmm. It's probably a new, new market. Yeah, personally I have not worked with any letters of credit for Cuba, um, but I I'm, I'm imagine we would uh, be able to check with our operations people that have been doing this for years but um, we can also look into what requirements we think are going to come out of that. That's a good question. Yeah, we'll have to get back to them on that one. Cool. Yeah, we can follow up with uh, an email with them. Um, are there are there alternatives to a letter of credit um, that it can ensure that the seller gets seller or buyer? I guess they didn't, they didn't specify, but um, that they, 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 to ensure that they get paid outside of the letter of credit. So you can do an open account where you're asking for a deposit up front and maybe all the money before it leaves. That's covering that. Letter of credit we talked about. You can do a documentary collection, which uh, is just the transaction of documents going back and forth, and that's more affordable. And you would really only want to use a documentary collection when it's at site. And at site means the foreign bank receives the documents, they see them, and they're going to make payment before they give the bill of lading to their customer, the import. If you were to do a documentary collection, you know, at 30 days, that means 
the foreign bank is going to accept documents, but payment's not going to take place for 30 days. The bank gives the bill of lading to that importer, and no one makes that importer pay in 30 days. So that's where you wouldn't want to do that. Instead of a, stand, uh, a, a letter of credit, another option would be a standby letter of credit. Well, Mr. Buyer, I'm going to give you open account, but I want you to put up a standby letter of credit that I can draw on because you didn't pay me. We have some exporters that do that across the board instead of using letters of credit. Each one of their overseas buyers opens up a letter, uh, standby letter of credit that just sits there and doesn't get drawn on because the open account uh, transaction takes place and the buyer pays the seller. It's just a safety policy, insurance policy. And then you can have actual insurance. There's something called trade credit insurance and it is sold by the XM Bank of the United States as well as private insurance companies like Euler Hermes. And that scenario is you get insurance policy against your foreign buyers and your foreign receivables. You pay a premium, and if that foreign buyer doesn't pay you, the insurance company will reimburse you for that loss to a certain percentage. So that's called trade credit insurance, and some people use that in lieu of letters of credit. That's good. That's great to know. Um, what is the buyer's responsibility for obtaining import permits or other import authorizations prior to obtaining a letter of credit? Import authorizations? Or import permits. So as an importer, an importer of record in any country is the one that's ultimately responsible for ensuring they're meeting the requirements of their country. So for example, in, a, in the US, if I'm a US importer, I need to make sure my government uh, regulations are being met. I need to know what those regulations are. And I need to make sure, for example, that the customs uh, duty rate that is being used for my goods is, uh, a, is the correct duty rate. All that obligation falls on me as an importer. Now, an exporter, the, buy, the buyer should have all the responsibility. The exporter can make it easier for the buyer by helping him knowing what his export regulations are, asking his freight forwarder to ask his counterpart in that foreign country. So for example, I think Scarborough has an office in Shanghai, right? Yes. I'm a shipper, I'm shipping something to Shanghai, and the, and the gentleman in Shanghai who's buying says, now do I need an import license to get this? And is there any you know, food and drug or fish and wildlife regulations that I have to meet? Let's ask Shanghai Scarborough to check into that for us and give us their recommendation on best advice. And then we would provide that information to the importer, but basically also making him know that ultimately he as the importer of record is ultimately responsible and what uh, Scarborough is doing is making recommendations. Great. Some great questions so far. Keeping your head spinning, I'm sure, yeah. a little bit. Yeah. Um, this is fun. I'm enjoying it. <laughs> well, feel free to have him keep coming in. I know we got uh, a few more to go, but uh, we have still a lot of time left so get them in um someone else would have with a follow-up question here to the uh the payment that we talked about earlier is the maximum time allowed to make payment is it five days or after receiving documents from the lc issuing bank so i'm guessing they're referring to how quickly they have to commit uh provide payments well if my understanding the foreign bank has five days to review the documents uh, and before they come back and say we accept these documents, and then honestly, I, I, I would have to ask my operations colleagues to tell me, after they accept documents, is there a requirement or how many days do they have to pay within? It could be five days to make payment, but you know, just because the UCP 600 says they have to pay in five days doesn't necessarily mean they do. There are unfortunately times where we have to you know, you know, check again and again with certain origin banks in certain countries because it, they're a little slow in making payments. Best case scenario is it's a top rated bank and payment takes place within the agreed upon uh, term. So I can check on that and ask you know, my colleagues to tell me after they've accepted documents, how many days may, might they have to make payment? Correct, yeah, okay, that's great. Um, I'm uh, <clears throat> seeing one here. It just says TT reimbursement allowed question mark. What does this mean? So is it something you well TT wire transfer reimbursement allowed question mark? They had, they would have to give me some more information 
um, to clarify what their question is. Okay, great. Maybe we'll get that coming back um, as well. How does how does a bankruptcy of a buyer affect a letter of credit and ability to ship and then get paid against that letter of credit? So uh, let's say an importer in a foreign country goes has a files bankruptcy after they had a letter of credit issued to a U.S. shipper. The obligation to pay is no longer on that importer of record. The obligation to pay is that bank. So what really needs to happen is that bank had taken collateral to open that letter of credit. So that was either a $100,000 hold on the line of credit or some other type of hold on the, uh, you know, the building or something that that importer has. So even though the buyer went bankrupt, this transaction still, still takes place. If the shipper ships the goods, meets every requirement on that letter of credit, submits documents to us, and we submit to that foreign bank, unfortunately, if that's the last penny that poor guy has, it's still getting wired to us and, go, and going to the, um, the shipper's account. So the U.S. seller doesn't have to worry. Um, my buyer goes out of business, I can, as long as my banks are still in good standing and all the, uh, all the requirements are met by the letter of credit, then I can get my money. Yes. Okay. Now, what if the freight can't get delivered to that seller because they're out of business? Is that, but it still makes to that country. Is that, uh, but as it, for honestly, it goes back to what are the requirements under the letter of credit? If the letter of credit only states you have to provide me with a bill of lading showing that the goods were loaded on the vessel, and then we provide that bill of lading to the foreign bank, that meets our obligation. Now, what the bank might do is they're in possession of the bill of lading for those goods, and if perhaps that importer owes the bank money, they probably aren't going to turn over that bill of lading to that importer until they get their funds covered as well. But if he had a $100,000 letter of credit and he had the money in his account, then the bank is going to give him the bill of lading and he could take possession. Okay. That's great. Um, is it important to have the inco terms listed on the actual letter of credit? Yes. You always want to have the, and you want to agree upon uh, ahead of time between the buyer and the seller what that letter of credit, I mean, those commercial terms mean. A lot of times people will say, well, I know what CIF foreign port means, but make sure your buyer knows the same thing you know. Some people think, well, I'm not liable for getting that cleared at the foreign port, or I'm not liable for demerge charges, storage charges at the foreign port. And you know maybe your buyer thinks you are. So best to have a clear understanding of what the two of you think. Even if your perception of the uh, inco term is incorrect, it doesn't matter because it's what you all agree to. Okay, great. Um, do do letters of credit compete with trade credit insurance, or is there insurance to cover the letter of credit as well? Yes, they do compete, and um, but we will have uh, an insurance policy. So as a bank, when we um, take the risk of confirming a letter of credit, we may have a policy with XM, and we might go for XM coverage saying, hey, we just took the risk of this foreign bank's uh, guarantee to pay $1 million to a shipper. And we're like, we're a little worried about that ourselves. We go and get insurance on our confirmation. So if things were to go awry, then we would be able to uh, be reimbursed by XM under our insurance policy. Okay. Have you ever had a situation for, for whatever reason, political or, or any other, the buyer's bank did not make payment? And if so, can you describe the situation and the outcome? For example, there's a certain country out there right now that is having a lot of chaos and turmoil, and they are not allowing U.S. dollars to leave their country. So people that were guaranteed payments in U.S. dollars uh, under a letter of credit are having a heck of a time getting their money out of that bank. And, you know, there's certain arrangements are being made now is that, you know, people are no longer willing to use that letter of credit. Uh, they want cash in advance to sell into that country. But what's happening is uh, you get a wire ahead of time to make payment for the goods, but the foreign country's government wants a record of that payment coming out of the, uh, their country. So they will ask the shipper to provide them with a documentary collection from a bank 
saying, here is a copy of the transaction that took place, but no payment is due because payment was made outside of that documentary collection. Okay. Now, would a uh, confirmed letter of credit help in that situation if it had been confirmed prior to that bank? Yeah, and then that's when you're moving the risk from the foreign bank to the U.S. bank, and that's where you know it goes to the bank, and the bank has to decide, hmm, am I willing to confirm this letter of credit? You know, and maybe I'm not. Maybe you know I won't offer a confirmation because of the risk factor that's going on in that country, or maybe you know. We will, but we'll get insurance to cover ourselves, and maybe we'll charge a higher premium. You know, or perhaps there might be another bank that is willing to confirm that letter of credit. We've had uh, requests from other banks to confirm letters of credit that are going through other banks, and they're basically asking us to partake in the risk. Hey, would you like to confirm that five million of this $25 million letter of credit? And you know, if, if the buyer looks good to us and the foreign bank looks good to us, you know, then we might participate in that, you know, to make the fee on that premium. Okay. That's great. Um, what criteria would justify using a letter of credit over not using a letter of credit for a, for a shipment? I'd say, you know, letter of credit fees, you know, they could add up. I mean, if it's a five, you know, to you know, $10,000 transaction, you're probably better off doing, you know, a deposit or open account or wire transfer. It, it probably would should be more than ten thousand dollars before you would consider, you know, arranging for an, a letter of credit payment. Okay. Uh, on a uh, great question so far, I got another one here. On a standby letter of credit, are there criteria that need to be met before the seller can draw on it? Uh, I.e., if you're if you're net thirty days with with them, can they draw on day twenty five? or do we still maintain some control over the draw? And can we set up additional criteria? Well, the criteria has to be agreed upon before it's issued. So on, so on the standby. So if the transaction is taking place between a buyer and seller, you both agree to what re, um, steps or what um, transactions have to take place before someone is eligible to draw on that letter of credit. Um, it gets dicey sometimes because we have some countries will have a performance letter of credit and then the foreign bank and the foreign buyer will say, hey, this is about to expire. I would like you to, is to uh, extend this letter of credit. And the shipper will say, no, I'm not going to extend that. Our agreement was you know, to this date. But then the buyer can go to his bank and say, they're in violation of the agreement. Here's my statement saying they're in violation of the agreement. Make a draw on that uh, standby letter of credit. And then the shipper's like, I didn't do anything wrong. Well, it's what, uh, what, what you say is required. If the importer you know, submits the documents to that bank, then that bank is going to draw on that letter of credit. So a lot of times we'll see a, a push and, and shove on that. The, the shipper realizes that they may draw on the letter of credit, so he may agree to extend that letter of credit for a further amount of time just to protect it. Okay, that's, that's great. Um, this actually will be uh, one of our last questions here. Uh, it's a little bit longer one. So what, what happens if you open a letter of credit and the goods ship and then they deliver and the letter of credit is paid out? And if the container arrives to the customer's warehouse and they realize that inside the box is or inside the container is just oil rags. You know, what guarantee or help do you get since the letter of credit is already cleared? Uh, with insurance, you have 30 days before you even notice or receive a claim confirmation. Lots of apparel companies don't have that long to wait. You've got uh, to get your money back and go find a new factory. So, so and then it's this is a good thing to understand. The sales agreement is outside of the payment agreement. So, if the shipper if you were importing something from China <clears throat> and what you actually got in the container was not what you purchased, the banks will still make the payment transaction if all the documents are met. What you need to do is unfortunately go to the International Chamber of Commerce and you know file a claim and file a lawsuit and, and try and fight that out between the seller and the buyer. My recommendation to you is this. There are third-party inspection companies out there 
like Society Day Surveillance, you know, um, Government Surveillance, SGS, and other pre-shipment inspection companies, ask that company, when they're in Shanghai, have a person go to the uh, warehouse, look at your purchase order, look at what you're ordering, and compare that to what's being loaded in that container and the seal is put on the container. That's a great uh, way to make sure you're getting what you're getting. The other thing I would recommend is check credit uh, app, um, history of your uh, suppliers. Um, you know, do, ask for recommendations. You know, we did that the other day for an importer. They said, I'm buying from somebody I, I don't know, and how can you help me? We did a credit check and provided them with information that was available to them. We asked our correspondent bank to tell us what they think about that customer. <coughs> Excuse me. And, you know, ultimately, it, it just comes down to, you know, uh, how much due diligence you can do and then what you can do to protect yourself. But that pre-shipping inspection is really the only way it's going to protect you because if those goods come in and it's oil rags, payment still gets made and you've got to sue. Okay. That's uh, the unfortunate circumstance. Right. Did you have anything else you wanted to No, I think that's it. Okay. That. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, that's something that uh, those third parties that can help do those inspections can definitely help in that process and alleviate that, that type of risk going forward. Um, well, you know, everyone else, if, the, if your questions didn't get a chance to get answered, we're going to try and uh, get those emails back with the answers and or um, other information that will help answer those questions for you. So uh, we're kind of running low on time, so we can't answer uh, any more questions, but uh, we will follow up with all the registrants, you know, if, and feel free to keep submitting those questions if, if you would like to have more information from Drew or from Scarborough on a, on a letter of credit. Um, I want to thank everyone for uh, coming, in, coming to the, the webinar and, and taking the time to diligently seek out more information on letters of credit. It's not a uh, very glamorous topic, but uh, it's definitely a necessary one if, to help, you know, increase your sales and profits overseas with international trade. Um, I invite you guys to check out next month's webinar. We'll be talking about foreign trade zones. So if that interests you or if that might pertain to your business, or even if not, you feel free to sign up on our website or it's through, through the emails that get sent out in our, in our newsletters. And uh, definitely come back next month to hear more about that. Drew won't be with us, but uh, we'll, have, we'll have someone else on foreign trade zones. Um, I appreciate everyone stopping by and thank you for uh, joining us today.